Hey, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Blaney. Uh, on the ITSM product marketing team. Just wanted to say uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's uh, community webcast on um, change management, configuration management best practices. I would ask that uh, for those of you who are on the phone, if you could keep your phones muted, that would be helpful uh, for everyone else to follow along. Uh, with us today, is uh, John Weston, who is going to take us through today's presentation. Uh, many of you have uh, either listened to John, uh, worked with John uh, in some capacity, has been uh, part of CA for uh, a number of years here, uh, well regarded uh, in terms of his knowledge. And so he's going to bring that to bear today on today's presentation around change and configuration management, best practices, where we're really going to kind of take a look at some of the key areas around change and config, uh, that, uh, you know, are typically kind of complex. And it doesn't always have to be that way, but, uh, you know, we all find ourselves, I hate to say, in the um, ubiquitous uh, rat hole, if you will, kind of getting too technical um, too quickly uh, without truly understanding some of these best practice processes uh, to make them easier to understand and deploy. And that's, that's where John's going to take us today. Uh, we'll also cover some key areas and some key features uh, with Service Desk Manager uh, and how that can actually help you um, in pursuit of, uh, you know, these change and, and configuration management best practices. So with that, uh, I will go ahead and pass things over to John. I just wanted to mention before we actually get started, we will be taking questions. Again, we will try to answer them uh, as we can, uh, given the number of questions. If we can't answer them on the call today, we'll try to get you a response as quickly as we can. So with that now, I'll go ahead and pass things over to John. It's all yours, John. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much. And I apologize, everybody. I'm, I'm working through a cold, so I'll have my finger poised over the cough button uh, to save you from that. But let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with some CMDP. Uh, deployment guidelines, then get into some advanced capabilities of Service Desk Manager, the Service Desk component of CA Service Management, and then wrap up with uh, a discussion about how change in configuration management can work together. So first, uh, some high-level definitions of what I'll be talking about. Uh, for our purposes, a service is really any sort of deliverable that you have for your end users. These can be highly abstracted services or very specific ones. Uh, for example, access to an application might be a service, or just the ability to connect to the internet might be a service. Any of a number of things can be a service, and usually around those, that service will be some set of expectations around availability and support. Um, configuration items or CIs are those things that compose the service. There are going to be the servers, the applications, maybe network devices, even documentation and so forth that help provide the service. And so ultimately configuration management as a discipline is concerned with discovering and maintaining those CIs, the CI relationships in their baseline definition, all with a, an eye toward maintaining stability and availability and quality of those services. Uh, configuration management as a process and discipline does give you certain benefits uh, of its own beyond just uh, its support of service management. And um, certainly CA Service Desk Manager helps with these as well. You know, we provide these functionality, uh, these functions as well. But some of the high level ones that I would point out here would be just establishing CI inventory in the first place and being able to establish those CI relationships. What are the providers? What are the dependents or peer-to-peer -peer relationships? Being able to assist through the use of discovery of CIs and relationships in root cause analysis as part of incident and product, excuse me, problem management is also very important. In change management, impact analysis becomes a very uh, key outcome of a, of a sound configuration management process. Ultimately, that last bullet point here of driving continuous continuous service improvement is a very big part of configuration management as well. So not just initial discovery of CIs, but then constantly updating 
the configured baselines for these configuration items in order to match reality and in order to meet with your requirements is a big part of this too. So I have some general guidelines for deploying the CMDB and then some specific ones around service modeling um, as well. So first of all, at a high level, not everything that is an asset is a CI, right, and, and vice versa. An example of something that would be an asset but not a CI would be like my laptop at, at CA. If my laptop has a problem, then certainly that's an issue for me, <laughs> but it, it's not like CA technologies uh, itself is experiencing a service disruption. It's, uh, it's an asset because it has a discrete hardware lifecycle and cost, but it is not helping to provide a service. Uh, likewise, something could be a CI without being a, an asset. A uh, homegrown application is a great example of that. You may not have any sort of licensing requirements around it, uh, but if it helps provide a service, then it is a configuration item. And another thing that um, is a great capability of Service Desk is that we can model assets and or configuration items within Service Desk. So you definitely can have uh, laptops or network devices that are not otherwise CIs stored in Service Desk. And the benefit that you might have from doing that is developing a ticket history. So if a technician uh, takes a call from an end user, they can go to that end user's uh, environment and look at what attributes are available for their laptop, maybe look at discovery uh, characteristics of it and so forth, and that helps them with troubleshooting. Um, certainly, in configuration management, uh, this would come into play as well. So if a technician is working on a change order that might be affecting some number of web servers, for example, then it definitely helps to be able to look at characteristics of those web servers, what applications are installed on them, and so forth. The third bullet point here I think really is pretty important. You don't feel like you have to do everything in phase one of your CMDB project. Uh, in my experience working with a lot of customers, that tends to be the big sticking point, is it can become such an, a seemingly insurmountable uh, task to, to discover everything, model everything, come up with a process for everything, that, that it never actually gets started. Usually what you can do is start with certain key services, the, the most you know, low-hanging fruit or the ones that are customer-facing, and model those and use what you learn from the process of modeling those to model others. And so this will help you figure out, okay, what, what are some good discovery sources for these CIs? What are good processes around updating those CIs and so forth? I do recommend that you keep discovery within the domain of the discovery tools. Uh, or management data repositories, MDRs. An MDR is any sort of system external to the CMDB that provides configuration item or CI relationship data to the CMDB. It can be something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, or it might be a CA tool like CA configuration automation, or Spectrum for that matter, or it could be you know, a third party tool like Microsoft SCCM, that's no problem. The MDR feeds information to the CMDB. The reason why I recommend that you keep the MDR responsible for discovery is that that tends to be the domain expertise of the MDR. The CMDB's role is to aggregate and reconcile data from one or more MDRs. The CMDB becomes the place where anyone can go who needs to look at the overall CI definition for a particular entity, a server or an application. But if somebody needs to look at it, maybe at a lower level, that's where the, the MDRs would come into play. And then finally, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of CA configuration automation or CCA. Uh, so take a look at it. If you own CA Service Desk Manager, then odds are that you have an entitlement to it. So it's worth a look. It's a good uh, CI and CI relationship discovery uh, solution. So in terms of services, um, the oh my animation didn't work on this one, <laughs> on the upload to the to the uh, to the PowerPoint. My apologies. Um, essentially, what this was was the uh, 
a, a nice complicated web of of the the infrastructure, the back end, the the back office stuff required in order to provide a service. Uh, you know, the network devices, the applications, storage, and so forth. And with a little animation overlay here, that the end user actually doesn't compare, care about all of that. What they care about is the service definition. And so. Um, that's what they care about, and it's up to you to model everything else. And so this becomes important when it comes time to look at what constitutes a service. You know, in this slide here, we're showing an example of, you know, a service that actually is wending its way through various application tiers, uh, supporting, uh, supporting application operating systems, hardware. Um, really, a service can potentially be quite complex or it can be pretty straightforward. It really does depend on the nature of the service that you're modeling and then also the way that you want to model it. And so I have some recommendations here. The first is that there are different ways of modeling these things. And yeah, my, I, it looks like WebEx completely ate my animation. No problem. Um, so I'll just, I'll just talk through them a little bit. Uh, the first is that uh, on this, We've got the concept of a service hierarchy. A service hierarchy is where you've got a service that uh, that is going to have different tiers, like here where we have the service, potentially a subservice, and then eventually the system and supporting CI entities below that. This is quite useful if you have, um, maybe as a subservice, you have an application, and then the service is front office applications for, for customers, for example, or, um, you know, our product suite for our customers, where you have some number of subservices, subservices below those with the entities that provide those different applications as systems and logical host layer and physical host layer devices uh, beneath those. So an example of this type of thing might be where you have uh, maybe you're a managed service provider, and you uh, you have a number of different packages that you offer your customers. Those packages could each be one of these subservices, where a given customer maybe actually uh, subscribes to multiple of these. And so at this point, the service definition becomes the package, the applications that support that package, and then the operating systems application development platforms and hardware and databases that provide those applications. So this becomes um, this becomes the the part of the or the part of the definition that gives that that constitutes the service hierarchy. Oh, here's an example or here's a question actually a, a very good one germane to this this topic. Can you give us examples of a service subset layer? and system layer, and what class it can accommodate in CACMDB. So an example of service subset layer would be, let's say that our service layer were something called uh, front office application. You might have as a service subset the, you might have just a very simple example. One service might be Office, Microsoft Office. Another subset might be SharePoint, uh, or another, uh, subservice might be service catalog. And these each would have their own supporting applications, hardware hosting those applications, operating systems, network devices, and so forth. But together those comprise a larger service called front office application. The benefit to going this route is that you can have different service level agreements different subscription rates, different reporting, and so forth at the, at the high end, at the very top level, the service layer, but also for those subservices. Now, another way of, or another consideration, actually, I would say, for modeling services is when you have peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, this one thing to watch for is how many sideways steps you're modeling as part of the service. Uh, the reason why I say to watch out, or, or I recommend that you watch out for this, is that the more of these hops you go sideways, uh, the larger the service definition becomes. And while that is not itself necessarily an issue, 
it can give some false positives when you're doing things like root cause analysis and impact analysis. Um, an example of something like this would be of a peer-to-peer -peer relationship versus a provider-to-dependent relationship would be, say, a, uh, an application server and its failover server for a disaster recovery scenario. If the failover server goes down for some reason, that does not necessarily immediately impact the, the actual primary application server. There is certainly a relationship between these two CIs, but it's not really a provider dependency uh, relationship. It's more of a peer-to-peer. -peer. And so that relationship can be modeled, but it's, a, a very, it's, it's an important question that you should answer as to whether that peer-to-peer -peer relationship is actually part of the service or not. Um, in some cases, it definitely will make sense uh, to have it as part of the service. In some, it may not. And so I just urge you to keep that in mind when, it, when you look at peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Other examples are purely networking or physical uh, communication style relationships. Um, for example, if a network device goes down and that network device is in between two servers, if another network device takes over for communication between those two servers, was the service affected? Um, probably not, right? So therefore, does that, is that relationship a crucial service relationship? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on your requirements. So these peer-to-peer -peer relationships are an interesting aspect of service modeling. And so I do recommend taking a look at those when you are modeling your services. So overall guidelines for developing your service structure would be first to select the appropriate structure. And on the left-hand side there, I, you know, I get into here a little bit of, first there's the hierarchy approach, what, what we were just looking at. Um, but then at the system management level, this is where we're getting into more of the peer-to-peer. -peer. This is where, for example, uh, network device connections or communication style relationships between network devices or between servers uh, becomes a consideration. These sorts of relationships are useful to model even if they are not part of a larger service. The reason for that is because they can still help with troubleshooting. So if as a technician I know that, uh, that these servers are connected uh, physically or via network connections, then that can help me with troubleshooting, such as when I see a whole bunch of alarms in my monitoring system. It helps me determine root cause. And then that bottom one on the lower left there, cost management, this is more where you are getting into service modeling from a, from a costing or uh, invoicing perspective. And this touches on maybe a whole other conversation, which is chargebacks and showbacks, being able to model and, and track subscription rates to your services and so forth. Usually, that's more in the domain of the service catalog less about troubleshooting, but certainly it's part of the conversation and might, might be something that you um, want to consider from the very ground level of your service definition. Other guidelines I would have would be, uh, yeah, definitely feel free to add or remove layers as required. So what we saw was a, a service with certain subservice layers, but if that subservice layer doesn't make sense to you, then remove it. Definitely, you can have a service definition with all of the CIs that provide the service uh, without having that subservice concept. That's absolutely possible. And in fact, I mean, that's more typical, in fact. Um, also, you know, um, at the technology layer or level, feel free to remove certain levels of abstraction as well. So a very common question in modeling configuration items is where at to depth do you model a component of a of a say a server as a CI of its own? For example, the network card uh, that's in a server, you could model that as a configuration item. The reason is it's a, it's a discrete entity. You can pull a network card out of one server and put it into another one, and in a way. The network card is dependent upon the server that it's in. If the server goes down, the network card isn't available too. Or the network card could just be a characteristic of the server. Um, 
I'd say the latter approach is the more common way, but that's an example of what we're talking about, being able to say, you know what, this is not an independent CI, this is a characteristic of another CI. And then finally, I would just recommend start simple. Like, I, like what I said before, um, start with certain key services and then build out from there, but also start with certain key relationships and build out from there. Now, in terms of relationships, um, Service Desk Manager includes a large number of CI relationships out of the box. You can certainly modify those, and you can create your own. Uh, but I do recommend starting with the out-of-the-box relationships just as, you know, to get an idea of the sorts of things that are possible. Um, you can define provider-dependent relationships both between service layers, that is, for example, between the service and the subservice, or between the subservice and, a, and an application, for example, but also between CI families in each layer. Here's what I mean by that. Um, you might have at the maybe at the hardware layer, um, hardware.server as a family of configuration items. Um, but you might also have a dependent layer called like a, a VM pot potentially that's hosted on that server. Um, that is something that you could model as a provider to dependent. The, the VM depends on the hosting hardware, um, even though they're both technically servers, uh, the virtual machine and the, and the host. So that is something to keep in mind as well. One last thing I'd say about CI relationships is that the CMDB visualizer in Service Desk is very, very cool. It, it gives you great visibility into CI relationships and also relationship types. So you can assign a different color, for example, between uh, rep, to represent different relationships. And that can really help out for eyeballing uh, a service and getting a lot of relationship data just from first glance. Okay, um, feel free to ask any questions uh, in the, in the Q&A part of the WebEx. I'll look for, for questions, and, and so will Chris and Jim. Otherwise, I'm going to jump ahead into the advanced CMDB function. What I mean by these advanced CMDB functions, by the way, is that Service Desk includes a whole lot of configuration management capabilities that we have added over the years uh, with various versions of Service Desk. And a lot of these, um, while they're there, they're documented in our, in our wiki, uh, either you know, our customers don't know about or just uh, end up not using uh, for various reasons. And so I want to uh, cover those. And uh, yes, the, the GR loader is covered in the advanced CMDB functions. I'll be covering that on its own slides here. Um, the first is the t transaction work area, um, or TWA. The TWA is essentially a staging area. What it allows you to do is when you're importing CIs and CI relationships into the, the CMDB, into the service desk database, you can choose to import them into this staging area, into the TWA. Uh, there are some benefits that, that come from this. The first is it helps you avoid creating duplicate records. It also lets you transform the data. So it gives uh, technicians with the proper permissions, of course, the ability to um, modify data before it ends up in the CMDB proper. So it, it's a good kind of like midway point or staging area, like I said, for dealing with CI imports. The overall way that you use it is you will load from the discovery source into the TWA. And the TWA uh, load, usually you're going to use something like the GR loader utility that is in included with Service Desk. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, you could also do this via SQL queries or, or a, a web services API call, but the most common one is through a GR load utility. And one of the options in the GR loader is to load to the TWA rather than to load directly into the CMDB. And when you do that, um, the CIs are initially loaded in what's called, or in the initial state, 
Um, this is a status of the transaction. So you'll see like new server with a bunch of server attributes, and those those that transaction is set to initial. So one of the things that a technician can do is maybe clean up the data, modify it, either directly through the service desk interface or through uh, SQL queries, for example, if that's the preferred method, and then set the status of that transaction to ready, for example. Um, then you can run the GR loader again to load from the TWA directly into the CMDB only those records that are flagged as ready. So that's kind of like the next step. So first load into the transaction work area, then make sure that you're not creating duplicates, maybe you know, transform the data to make it more consistent with how your CMDB is already formatted, and then load from the TWA into the CMDB. Um, and so the CMDB becomes a, ver that's, that's its main purpose, is to help you with, uh, with avoiding duplicates and so forth. We will see it pop up and a couple of other of the more advanced CMDB functions a little bit, though, such as finding ambiguous CI. One of the main things that it helps with, though, is CI reconciliation. And uh, reconciliation is one of the main functions of any configuration management database or CMS. And the main purpose of this is to make sure that when you import configuration items or create them from scratch within the interface, that you're not creating a duplicate. Uh, and the example that I have on this slide is, is actually pretty common, where let's say you have three different CIs or three different records coming in from three different discovery sources. One source has the CI named Server 1. Actually, all three have a name for the CI and it's the same name. But one shows a MAC address of 1111 and so forth. The other has a different MAC address, and the third doesn't have any MAC address at all. So the reconciliation rules say, okay, so what are we supposed to do about this? Are these three different servers? Or is it two servers? Or is it one server? Uh, that's what reconciliation is all about, is uh, being able to deal with situations like this. The CMDB has a, the concept of reconciliation priority, uh, and I have them listed here. For, so the first one, that, that, uni, uh, that unique identifier, or the ID, is actually going to be pretty uncommon. Um, <laughs> the way this would work is if the incoming record for the configuration item or CI relationship already has a unique identifier as given to it by service desk, uh, then, then of course there's no reconciliation really required. It knows exactly what record to attach the update to. Um, the reason I say that's uncommon is because it would require a bidirectional integration. You know, the CMDB would have to update its discovery tools, its MDR, um, in order to give them that unique identifier for use later. And that's not common, right? Um, normally the flow of information is from the MDR to the CMDB. It's unusual for one of those MDRs to need information from the CMDB. So definitely the, the, the capability is there and naturally enough that is the most trusted possible state where the MDR has identified directly by this unique identifier. Um, which CI it's updating. The next level down from that would be where we do have a registered MDR in Service Desk with an MDR name and class and a discernible federated asset ID for the in incoming record. Um, what this means is the CMDB is going to have to create a new record for this incoming data, but it's coming in essentially from a trusted source. It's coming in from a, a discovery system that has already been established for the CMDB. Um, and that's just an administrative function of the CMDB to create these, these uh, MDRs. Uh, the wiki for Service Desk covers how to do this, but essentially what you're doing is you're, you're registering the MDR, and that means that when looking at the version history for a configuration item, each of the attributes that have been updated by that MDR 
or rather by import from that MDR will be flagged as such. Um, I'd say that the third way this, via these reconciliation attributes is probably the most common level of, you know, kind of priority. Uh, just because so often you're going to be importing from systems either as part of a, a one-off import or you're importing from a spreadsheet or you're importing from a flat file, something where you're not, it's not necessary to register it as an MDR. It may not be an ongoing import that you're going to schedule and so forth. It's more of a one-off sort of thing. In that case, the CMDB uses attributes of the incoming data in order to do its best to spot duplicates. And it uses what are called the, the CORA rules in order to do this. And these rules are pretty straightforward. Uh, essentially what it's looking for is combinations of attributes that might already exist on other CIs already in the system. So for example, if, uh, let me, uh, point out, like on the first row here, if the name is unique and there are no other attributes of these Quora attributes, then of course the CI is going to be created. I mean, that's that's quite obvious, right? Um, but less obvious would be things like, well, what if um, the the, um, the name is unique, but all the other attributes about it, like serial number, MAC address, and so forth, are duplicates? You know, they're, they're values that already exist in the CMDB on a, on a configuration item. Well, the CORA rules would identify that as a duplicate. The idea being that some discovery sources might have a fully qualified domain name, some may not, um, or there just may be a different name given to a server, for example, in one third-party discovery tool versus in another one. And if everything else is the same, then the system figures it's pretty safe to identify that as a duplicate. But on the other hand, um, let's say uh, you've got uh, you know a unique a duplicate MAC address, uh, but unique system name. So the road uh, just above that. Here it may very well be that you've got a new server with where you've just taken the network device out of, or the network card rather, out of one server and put it into another one. So MAC address all by itself is not enough to make it a duplicate. Um, so these rules are used in the absence of, uh, of those higher trust scenarios. This is one of the reasons though why we recommend using the transaction work area is because, you know, these rules can't necessarily cover every possible contingency. Let me just see if uh, there are other questions that have come in. Um, actually, yes. Oh, actually, several. So let me take a moment to uh, to look at the questions. Pardon me. So the first question is, what approach should we take in order to maintain CI changes uh, of attribute values? I think what you're getting at there is what happens if a discovery tool updates an attribute? Uh, how should you maintain control of that possibly? Well, um, essentially change management as a discipline is one, one of its main goals is controlling updates to the CI attributes. And so uh, a good guideline for determining whether something should be a, even a CI or not in the first place is whether it is subject to change control. If it's a device that you need to go through, you know, log a change order in order to update it or an application that you need to get a change order in order to update, then that's probably a CI. And the attributes for it are under change management. So one of the things that you can do is track updates that have happened uh, that have been made to a CI as part of a change order versus what are called rogue updates. And this is something that I get into in the CACF, the, the uh, last part of this presentation. So I'll, I'll cover that in the, in the change audit or configuration audit and control facility. But essentially it's whether it's under change control or not. Um, 
And then MAC addresses for virtual servers. How do, how do we expect MAC addresses for virtual servers when we try to import service from GR Loader? Actually, most VMs will have a MAC address. Uh, so it, you should have MAC address entries even for VMs. Uh, so that shouldn't be a problem. I, I hope I understood the question properly. And then let's see, why sh uh, should we receive an error when targeting a CI and attempting to update it via transaction work area, the hardware changed. Uh, hardware has changed. Is it a registration error on certain CIs that we can modify? It? Okay, so specific uh, questions about updating CIs. I, gosh, I, it could be a number of different things. Um, it's possible that you're updating a, you know what, I'm going to have to take those offline. It, it could be any of a number of things that are, cause, that are uh, preventing updates to particular attributes. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to get those. I apologize offline. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep plugging ahead here. So the, the ambiguous configuration items or ambiguous CI, uh, this is another area where trans, the transaction work area comes into play. An, an ambiguous CI is one that it may or may not be a duplicate. Um, it does share certain attributes with other CI. And what you can do is run what's called an ambiguity check in order to create an ambiguity index score. It's very straightforward how this works. Uh, essentially, if you're looking at a particular CI, um, it's going to have, and you've run an ambiguity check against it, it will have an index number. And that number is the number of attributes shared by other CIs with that CI. Uh, so, for example, the example I give in the second bullet point there, an ambiguity index rating of two means that this CI has two attributes of those Quora attributes in common with either the same CI elsewhere in the CMDB or one attribute in common with two different CIs in the CMDB. So it's it's a very, you know, it's very much kind of like a, uh, a basic rating, but it is a good way of spotting potential duplicates so that as a technician, you don't have to go through every item in a TWA. You can maybe just go for those ones that have the higher ambiguity indexes. And the way to run that is through a command uh, as, as given here. And we'll be sharing, I mean, this is laid out in the wiki, but we can also uh, share this as part of the WebEx or share the PowerPoint. Now, when you have identified the ambiguous CIs, there's a way of dealing with them. <laughs> the, the first is to do nothing. You know, if it's, if it's sort of a one-time thing, um, you know, where, oops, it looks like, you know, we were importing from a spreadsheet maybe, and actually, uh, you know, the spreadsheet was inaccurate. I can update the data. It's no longer an ambiguous CI. It's no longer a duplicate. We're good. Um, or you can mark it as being not ambiguous. Um, that means, in other words, sure, you know, it, it has the same, say, um, server name, but not the same system name, and, and we're fine with that. We're fine if it has the same server name. Um, and just mark this as being not in, in a, ambiguous and move on from there. Or you can activate the CI altogether. Or finally, you can supersede the CI. And this is actually something that I get into in the next section. Superseding a CI is a good option if it's likely that you're going to continue to receive these updates from, on the CI. So if you've got a management data repository that will continue to update, you know, to uh, export data to the CMDB, and you think that this, the same ambiguous CI is going to keep popping up over and over and over again, then superseding it is a good idea. And that's my next section. So a superseded CI, it's very straightforward how this works. Um, when you supersede a CI, any updates to that CI that come in are automatically redirected to the superseding CI. The superseded CI is not deleted. It's not gone. It, ticket history and, and you know audit log and so forth are still there, 
It's just that from that point forward, any updates are going to go directly to the superseding CI. Um, also, when someone does a search for that CI by name, they're going to spot the superseding CI, not the superseded CI. Uh, it takes basically a specific search to look for superseded CIs. Uh, you can also look on a superseding CI record at its at any records it is superseding as well. Um, as I say here on the first bullet point, if this is sort of a one-off, it's usually a better idea just to fix the input data. But it, but if you are going to continue to receive updates uh, and you don't have the time or don't have the ability to fix the actual export, you know, to fix the tool that is providing these, these incorrect updates, then the superseding is a good option. What you do is you you just say, you know what, we're constantly going to be getting updates to, you know, called server one, two, three, when it's actually server ABC. Let's just supersede one, two, three over to this server ABC, and that's fine. We'll continue to get updates to it. The superseding will update the, the appropriate server correctly. Um, so it's for a very specialized purpose, but it can be very handy in those in those cases. Um, one last thing is that last bullet point. You know, as you would expect, if you supersede a superseding CI, <laughs> sort of create a a, a grandparent CI, um, then it does flow up. So the the original superseded CI updates to it do flow all the way up to you know to the second layer up. So um, you definitely can do that. That's probably a very uncommon occurrence, but but it does work properly. Now the GR loader or general resource loader is a utility that is include or a command that is included with Service Desk Manager, and it is used for importing CIs and CI relationships into the T the TWA or directly into the CMDB. Um, it is, gosh, it has a huge amount of capabilities now. Um, we've updated it in recent versions of, of Service Desk. Uh, for example, now you can you can import straight out of an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you can use it to transform data. You can use it to get information, uh, like in this third bullet point here. You can run a GR loader command in order to uh, to have an echo out to your command uh, command window of all of the attributes of a specified class of configuration item, uh, even you know, and certainly you can use it to update CIs and CI relationships. Um, it will run. Usually, it's run on a, on the on a primary server of Service Desk, uh, but you can certainly deploy it to other servers as well, and and uh, this becomes a a, a a good option if security is an issue. If you want some users to be able to run the command, but you don't need those users to have access to the to the actual service desk server itself. Um, and the wiki does include directions on how to do that. Um, one of the big gotchas that I see out there for um, for running GR loader commands and getting errors is the GR loader, when you specify an attribute for an import, and that attribute is actually an SREL, uh, uh, is actually pulling values from a table, not it's not a free, you know, string, free entry text string field. Then the, the GR loader needs to or or the import set needs to include a valid value for that attribute or else GR loader will throw an error. So for example, the, I mean a very common example of this would be like the manufacturer and model attribute. Lots of times the discovery source will have say, you know, Microsoft as the as the manufacturer. When in your ver in your copy of service desk, you might have that manufacturer entered as Microsoft Incorporated. Um, if the import set includes Microsoft but not Microsoft Inc., then that's it's going to generate an error when you run the GR loader with that attribute. 
And that's just because uh, – think of the GR loader as essentially entering these CIs from scratch. You know, if a, if a user were having to enter this CI and they tried to enter just Microsoft in that example, um, they wouldn't find an attribute for that field. They'd have to actually go to the dropdown and select Microsoft Inc. Um, and that's all I mean by this page is watch out for these attributes. And again, these are listed in the wiki because these are ones that have to have actual valid values. And in my experience, uh, both my own experience and also working with customers, um, that this tends to be one of the, the things that causes the most errors on loads of GR loader. Another is if you're loading CI relationships using GR loader, which is definitely possible, um, the CIs themselves have to exist. Those are essentially required components of the relationship. You know, you've got a provider CI and a dependent CI uh, or two peer-to-peer -peer CIs. Those CIs have to actually exist in the CMDB for the relationship to be imported. So sometimes that, that, that pops up with an error as well. Um, let me double check on Q&A. Uh, let's see. Um, Sergio, uh, the, uh, I see your question about the Quora attributes. Uh, you know what? I pulled that table directly from the wiki. So uh, it's possible that the table is wrong in the wiki, um, but I do, I do recommend checking out the, the reconciliation section of the CA Service Management Wiki for the most recent uh, versions of those rules. Um, Nicholas, it is not possible currently to customize the Quora attributes for reconciliation rules, um, you know, to a specific class or family. It's those those rules are going to uh, apply globally. So, if you do need specialized rules for it for a different family or class, usually you would handle that at the like at the GR loader level, where you can have different trans you can have different transformation rules for spotting those sorts of duplicates either in the TWA or maybe in the import set itself. Um, let's see, best way to maintain projects in the CMDB? That, that's a great question, and that actually ties back to the service definitions, I think. Um, there are two most common ways I see for doing it, and they're both good. One is to have a project represented as a type of service. So when, remember that in that service hierarchy we had the service level and then subservices, a super service can be a project. So uh, for example, you might have a project called um, modernized front office application. That's the project maybe. And that project might have a number of services under it, each one corresponding with an application, a front office application, that's part of that overall project. So that's one way of doing it. And the benefit there would be that you can have a ticket history for the whole project. You can have SLAs for any sort of activity impacting the whole project. Certainly you can run reports that aggregate data across the whole project, and you can see who are relevant stakeholders for the entire project that way. Um, another way to go would be to have a project as essentially just a characteristic of, like, of a change order. So you might have, uh, excuse me, Um, a project that is more of, instead of being a service, it is a sort of a super change order where one or more change orders are going to be part of that overall project that, and those changes might represent the different types of activity that are required as part of the project. So maybe needs assessment, requirements gathering, testing, um, the, you know, deployment, post-implementation review, these are all not just phases of an individual change, but maybe of the overall project as well. Uh, so those are the two main ways that I have seen project projects modeled, either as a service, if it's going to be a very long, like long uh, standing project, or as a particular type of change. Um, let's see. ZSX hosts with type recovery management. Essentially, we have two configuration items with the same host name. Oh, yeah, that's a toughie. Um, 
use the FX host. Think about that for a moment. Yeah, if you have two two configuration items with the same host name, gosh, that is a that is a good question. Um, you could have them as discrete CIs under essentially a pool. So in other words, the SRM I think probably has a pool for managing the different VMs. I hope I'm saying this properly. In which case, you sort of have a a service tier just for the for the pool, and the pool becomes a CI. Um, and essentially the hosts become hardware components uh, underneath that pool, uh, or actually technically above the pool. Um, but yeah, you still need a way to fully, you know, differentiate the two. Probably you have a system, you have different system names, serial numbers, and so forth. You might just give them different server names as well. If they're, if enough of the characteristics are unique then the host name, I believe, according to the core rules, won't be enough to, to flag them as duplicates. If, but if all else fails, I mean, in that case, it's fine to have duplicates. I mean, the, the system itself will, will be okay with that. Uh, it's just a, it becomes a usability issue. If you, um, you don't want technicians accidentally, accidentally assigning activity to the wrong, uh, the wrong device. Okay, we're, I'm running low on time. So I do want to cover the last topic, which, which was how we bring change in configuration management together, uh, how we take advantage of configuration management as part of change. And then I'll get back to the Q&A. In change management, the, I guess at a high level, um, change management is concerned with the overall process for updating these CIs and services. Um, it provides the framework around the activity that goes into that, but also the approvals policy behind the, uh, that has to happen before fulfillment can take place. There are certain benefits that accrue from, from a good change management process, uh, you know, fewer outages, swifter resolution, more efficiency in general. The CMDB can really help out in a couple of key places in change management. The first is from uh, initial detection of the error in the first place. That is, um, you know, some MDR has updated the CMDB with, or is trying to, with an attribute that's different from the established baseline configuration for that CI. In that case, a technician can be notified, say, or, or, or pick up on that, Either way, and notice, whoa, that's a rogue update. This is something that the system can, can uh, or has the concept of, is rogue updates or rogue inserts of CIs. So initial detection of a possible uh, unauthorized change is one place. But then also, at the tail end of the process, once we've done the change, we've done the impact analysis that the CMDB can help out with, then verifying that the that the change was deployed properly is another key area where the CMDB can help out. Let's see how we can help out with this. And there's a function in the CMDB or in Service Desk called the CACF, Configuration Audit and Control Facility. It sounds really weird, um, but really it, it's quite simple to describe. Already you're able to associate CIs with a change order. You know, we are going to update the operating system for these six servers. We're going to patch the OS. Um, what the CACF allows you to do then is to say not just what CIs will be updated by the change order, but what attributes. So if you were using the CACF as part of this change order, you would not just identify the servers that were being updated, but you would be saying the OS version is the attribute that is being updated and specifically to version, you know, version 10, service pack 2 or something like that. And so what this lets you do is get down to a lower level in your change management uh, for purposes of identifying those approved versus unapproved changes. There are two types of people who are going to be making use of the CACF stuff. Uh, I won't go into this in great detail, but essentially the administrator is going to be concerned with um, 
defining the attributes in the first place, that is, which attributes can be modeled within the CACF, uh, defining the policies around them, so how to deal with these rogue updates and rogue inserts, defining the MDRs, and so forth. Um, the change analyst is responsible for owning the change order, for identifying which CIs are going to be part of this, the change, and then also what attributes will be part of the change, and how how those CI attributes will be verified. So speaking of verification, here's here's what that means. So um, let's say we were, well, I'll use that same example. We we have a change order where six change or six web servers are having their operating system patched. So we've identified the operating system attribute as the attribute that is going to be updated. And we've beyond that, we've flagged a particular value that these that, that attribute should contain after the change order is implemented. We can then therefore or subsequently specify how to verify this. So we might say verify it based on our next, you know, based on update from a discovery tool, based on a GR loader import or a web services API call through integration with a, a discovery tool. Or we might say this is going to require manual verification by a technician. Um, in either of those two cases, you can set up a policy that, that will not allow the change order to be considered resolved, to be resolved until this verification has taken place. You can also uh, say, you know what, if the, ch if the change owner sets the change to resolved, then we assume the verification has taken place. So that's, a, that's a, another way you can handle the verification. Um, and that's what I'm covering on this slide here is the, the example. So just accept the plan value where, uh, you know, the, the technician accepts it, moves on with the rest of the change process. Um, or automatically updating the CI attribute with the planned value if the change is considered resolved, and so forth. Um, I definitely recommend checking out the wiki for this, the, for the uh, CACF function. It's a really cool capability of service desk. And that is it for my PowerPoint. There were a lot of things in there, so I'm going to check back on, on Q&A and uh, see. Um, yes, yeah, so quite, so one question is, so working my way backwards, so uh, send the link for the wiki you have referenced. Yeah, so um, the wiki is at wiki.ca.com, and when you go to that page, you're just going to enter as the product name, CA Service Management, and that will take you to the full wiki where you can do a search for any of a number of different topics, including everything that we've covered today. It's extremely comprehensive, the wiki. I mean, it covers, you know, high-level discussions, but also step-by-step -step guides on how to do these sorts of things. Um, so I do recommend wiki.ca.com. We will be making this PowerPoint presentation available as well. Um, Let's see if you get, and then uh, the last question is, get a registration error on certain CIs, but cannot modify any field on a CI when registration error is shown. Gosh, you know what I mean? That also could be a number of things. Um, it, gosh, I, I, boy, I hate to give such a short answer, but we're out of time. I do recommend opening up a case with support on that. I'm so sorry, but um, it, uh, it could be that it's just creating a duplicate or that there's a, a record lock potentially on the CI. It could be a couple of different things that are preventing the registration of the, or preventing the creation of the CI. So I do recommend uh, going to support. Oh, and the very last thing is CACF need a, need a license. It's just part of normal service desk. So it's, it's built into the service desk interface. Uh, the, the analyst using it is going to be using an, you know, an analyst license in service desk as, uh, as they would with any other function in service desk. So it's built in. And uh, and that's it, I guess. Uh, Chris, Jim, that I'm I'm finished with my part of it. Hey, John, that was uh, that was fantastic. That was uh, fully uh, fully loaded with a lot of great um, information, best practices, tips, uh, and uh, answering some of these questions obviously are, are somewhat tricky. Um, 
but uh, I hope that uh, for, for everyone who was on the call, has been on the call, uh, it was helpful. Uh, obviously, these are, you know, somewhat complex uh, processes, as we mentioned at the top of the hour, and uh, hopefully this has been uh, a good, uh, uh, a good uh, time spent um, listening to John and, and his presentation, and as he mentioned, uh, the presentation will be uh, available uh, for you to download. So with that, I would just say, John, fantastic. Thank you very much. Chris, I, I think we're, we're done here at the top of the hour. I know we're just a few minutes over. Uh, what I would ask is uh, keep your eye out on the community. We're going to be uh, posting the next three topics, um, upcoming topics uh, for our community webcast. That should be posted uh, hopefully by the end of this week. And uh, again, hopefully these, uh, these webcasts have been helpful uh, for everyone on the call. I'd like to say thanks again and uh, have a great uh, rest of the week and a great holiday. And we will be talking to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, everyone. Happy New Year.